thank you for attending our council meeting tonight. We appreciate you being here. We realize that uh, you have families and you choose to be with us, and we appreciate that and coming and listening to our council meeting, being part of our community. We thank you for that. Um, we will have our invocation by uh, council member Mark Thompson to start our meeting. So. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful to meet together today as in the City Council meeting. And we pray that thy inspiration will be with us. We're grateful for this time of year as we think of gratitude and think of the many blessings that we receive. We have a blessing of being part of this great country. And we pray that, pray that those who are guiding it will be inspired and directed how they can be best to their service. We're grateful for thy tender care. and pray that thy spirit will be with us in this meeting tonight, that we'll be able to consider things wisely and patiently. And we do so in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. There's your music. Uh, we will have the pledge by uh, DJ Bach. Come on, Ladies and gentlemen, will you please rise, honor your colors, and replete the Pledge of Allegiance after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Bott and Councilmember Thompson. We appreciate that. Um, before we, we before we go any further into our agenda, um, and under new business, we pulled uh, two items off the agenda. Um, first one is the recommend changes to the field use agreement, um, and we need to we need to review that. And then also, uh, we're moving the request of approval for the resolution to authorize uh, the mayor to sign an envelope agreement with Perry for the fire and ambulance service. Um, both of those uh, we need to review more. So we're actually pulling those from the agenda tonight. So. Um, as we move on to the agenda, I need approval of the minutes, November 6th and November 20th, 2014 council meetings. Mayor, prior to our approval, uh, there's some corrections that need to be made. Uh, one is the name change uh, on uh, November 6th. Uh, in the public comments uh, about for the public hearing there on the, uh, the bond for the USU, Jason Hiram is actually Jason Yurka. I didn't hear his last I know. Name, so so okay. it's your game. Don't ask me how to spell it. Okay. <laughs> but I know it's your game. And then also, last I noticed in uh, last week's or the last council minutes, I wasn't in attendance, but on one of the votes you had me as voting as I. Oh. But you also had me in non attendance. So if you just okay. make that correction. Okay, On November 6th, um, Mayor Pro Tem, when the council member reports, uh, this is Mayor Pro Tem Thompson. Council member Peterson added a few added to Mr. Byler's comments. I'm pretty sure that needs, needs to be Council member Thompson. Um, and then I had one other question regarding the sidewalk deferral that came up in the minutes. Um, it, it appears that we deferred the sidewalk on all properties, um, judging by the way this. Um, motion reads uh, to to defer them indefinitely is the wordage until the city determines that sidewalk is needed in that area I thought it was our intent that we deferred the one indefinitely that already had the home on it but that the empty building lot that was still able to build on when they built the home they would be required at that time to put the sidewalk in and that's not the way I believe it reads maybe it is if but I think we need to make that clarification on the motion if, if I understood it right. From what I understood when we made the motion, we were going to not worry about the, the lot in the middle. Yeah, because it already had the uh, sidewalk right. in front of it. Right. Mm -hmm. right. so we were but like, it's the other lot directly right. behind that doesn't right. it end. Is that the one you're talking about, the one behind? The one on 400 West. Yeah, we didn't say when that one was going to get put in. No, on, full, on the, uh, the one that faces, is it 200 West or? Faces east, no, no, west to the, the, e the east side of the block. 
the, the lot on the east side of the block we talked about uh, right. my recollection of the motion here. was that the sidewalk was tied to the development of that property not not an indefinite and that's even in minutes if you read in the previous motion by council member far says council member bought supported installing sidewalk when a home is built uh, because it's easier to add the cost and i think that was the intent of the motion right um, but I, I need, I'm just asking. Uh, Who made the motion? Was it oh, far? Far, We're far gonna have made. to fix that when far gets back because I could swear that we made it where we were going to do sidewalk on either one, but the one in the back on the corner west. Yeah, that's that what we're talking about. Yeah, right. that one we would do when it was. When and it was that's what I'm saying. Right. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's what I thought too. Yeah. But I think you're right. The way that. The, the amended motion, it seems like it reads that we're doing both indefinitely. Clear. Everything's well, different. There's not an amended motion. <laughs> it, it says on the bottom, motion. amended motion. Yeah. It says amended motion on line 36. Page. Yeah. Oh, we're down there. Okay, I haven't got that part yet. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. So the way that reads to me, that, that defers it yeah, indefinitely, it and I don't think that's our, that was the intent of the motion. So maybe we need to explain that. Where it's a motion, we'll have to have him readdress that. Right. Okay. Right. So I don't know if we can hold off on approving the minutes until we talk to him yeah. about that. We're going to have to. Let right. me make a motion we table the approval, <laughs> approval of the minutes of the what? Uh, November 6th. November 6th. November 6th. <clears throat> until uh, Councilman Farr is here. So we can still do a motion to approve the November 20th. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So I need a motion on November 20th. Second. Any other discussion? All favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion passes. Thank you. Um, we need to excuse Councilmember Farr. He's out of town tonight. And we will move into the public comment period at this time. Hi, I'm Lee Johnson. I live here in uh, Brigham City. And thank you all for paying attention to. Uh, the details of your discussion that actually ends up being a very important matter when it comes to you know contractors doing work so <laughs> anyway um i thought it was pretty interesting doing some historical research and i made a comment that you know basically brigham city is a church and and yeah i i again you know state that he goes it is the church of the social gospel um, it goes long back. It started about um, what's that? Second Great Awakening back in the 1840s. Of course, you know, Brigham City wasn't founded back then, but the movement was on, and uh, well, it picked up steam in the uh, what do you call it? The Gilded Age, basically the uh, Second Industrial Revolution, or the the one most notably known as the Industrial Revolution in the United States, and with the uh, well, scientific management of John Winslow Taylor and and a whole bunch of progressives and social activists, and anyway, there was a whole movement called the Good Government Movement, and that brought about the uh, was it National Municipal League, and they had a whole bunch of policies that came out, and well, if you look at Brigham City's original charter. It actually follows the constitutional model laid out by the federal government. But when Utah became a state, then the state legislature took over and started messing up what was a system of checks and balances in order to identify corruption. But without checks and balances, now we have corruption rampant in our city. We just don't know it because there is no opposition in government. Unfortunately, our uh, our mayor is actually a member of the council, and we don't have a justice of the peace. We actually have to take it to the state, you know, circuit court, in order to address it. But uh, you know, they look at it from the point of view of the state, you know, the state laws, as opposed to the will of the people who are, you know, in the city. So that was interesting. If you want to read up more about it, um, what is oh, in 1918, Walter Rauschenbusch actually wrote up the theology of it and that's where we get this concept of um, what, um, what social redemption where we actually prevent people from breaking the law so that we can save their souls <laughs> anyway it, 
it's kind of interesting how uh, how our system has changed over the years. But in essence, it is it is a church. It is a religion. So thank you. Thank you, thank you Lee. Lee. Becky Maddox, Brigham City. Uh, Tonight I wanted to explain some of the reason why I and, and some other people are concerned about some of the things that are going on in, in the city and, and in the government, federal and, and state and local, meaning county and, and even with this body. Lately, um, here in the United States, we've had some pushbacks against some of the executive orders that the president has issued. And a number of presidents for some time have issued executive orders and the orders that they issue are unconstitutional. In, sec in Article 1, Section 1 of our U.S. Constitution, the first thing it says, and the only thing it says, is all, all legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives. So when presidents, whoever they may be, try to get uh, the federal government the Congress and you know the, the Senate and the House of Representatives to pass bills that he wants, he's out of the line. When George Washington was president, he one time made an executive order to try and get other people in the government to do something that he wanted. And then someone came up to him and reminded him that that was not the original intent of executive orders. The executive orders are to be something like, since Christmas falls on Thursday this year, all the employees in the executive department may have Thursday and Friday, the 25th and 26th of December, off as holidays. Now that's the kind of executive order that was envisioned by the Founding Fathers. And what the problem is, when government steps out of its proper role, steps out of its cage, so to speak, that then there are unintended consequences. For example, um, today we, the federal government has signed on to many international agreements that were run into thousands and thousands of pages. And that then when they sign on to it, that binds us not to do what's best for our country, but to do what the international people tell us that we have to do. Um, another thing is when the city or the county or the state takes money from the federal government that the federal government has no business controlling, then um, there are those in the, in the federal government who want to get rid of private property because then they can control the people. And so then people say, oh, well, we, we have to get these loans from the federal government because that's our tax money and we have to get our tax money back. And so we talk ourselves into doing something that will not be helpful, that will only get us into trouble. And so it, we get ourselves over a barrel and what we need to do to get out of this problem, and I, and I realize that this problem's been going on for a long time, is to start to say no. No, we can't take money from the federal government because it only entangles us in bigger things that we don't need to be entangled in, and it's not the right that we get entangled in. And so, like for example with the red leg loan that for, for the hotel, if someone who's supposed to pay that money back doesn't pay the money back, then the city's on the hook for it, which means us as taxpayers are. With Utopia, that should never have happened, and so then the, the cities then have to pay more and more and more money, so then we have to tax the people more and more and more, and there's a limit to how much they can be taxed. So the reason that many of us say, please, don't go there, is because we want to get away from these entangling alliances and agreements and get to the point where we can do, where you can do them, what's best for our city, not what somebody that's loaned you money has told you you had to do. And then that way, we don't lose our, prop, our private property. Time's up, Becky. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Becky. You're welcome. Um, I wanted to comment on the video recording. 
and no offense to the people that are here now videotaping that I believe we should, the city should do in-house recording because it's a cheaper. Um, you could purchase an inexpensive video camera, put it on a tripod in the back of the room, have a city employee that usually comes to these meetings operate the camera during the meeting and then post it on YouTube on the next day. This will save the taxpayers money. Also, I want to report on the smart meters. I gave this report to several of you and to um, Bruce Leonard. It's on radio frequency radiation, the invisible hazard of smart meters. Um, I hope that you read it and do not ignore, ignore the information that it contains. The best way to look at what's happening to us is, is, is you need to follow the money. In October of 2009, the U.S. Department of Energy announced the $3.4 billion in stimulus grants. Um, they say they have all this money, but they don't have any money because they're printing money. And every time a country prints money, it usually doesn't end well. Anyway, um, my smart meter was put on my home the very next month of November 2009. I was unaware of the health, property, privacy, and security dangers. Now that I am informed, other citizens need to be warned. It is a responsibility we should all be involved in, in protecting our, our neighbors' health, property, privacy, and security. I believe Bree has taken priority instead of choosing to do no harm. The majority of the public has no clue what is happening to them, and the mass media is being compliant to the elite and their secret plans. No one has told the truth. Again, please do, please do not ignore this report that I gave you of the damages to the people's health, property, privacy, and security. Also, I'd like you to reconsider the agreement with AT&T put smart cells on telephone poles. This will bring even more electromagnetic radiation. Um, our bodies cannot tolerate all this. We are being bombarded. Most medical professionals and veterinarians have no training in the electromagnetic uh, radiation field, and so, and the health damages that it causes. So often the symptoms go and can be misdiagnosed. We are up against the collusion of corporations and governments. The analog meters need to be kept where they have been and then where they have been replaced with smart meters. The old analogs need to be brought back at no charge to the citizens. Let's please put the people first instead of greed and profits. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we appreciate uh, the, the comments tonight from uh, our citizens, and now we will uh, start with our council members and have our council member comment period. And we'll start with uh, Mr. Peterson. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna be here all night. Going to give the notes. Um, just a few things. We, we didn't have uh, too many meetings between the my committee sat between the last meeting and this meeting. But I did have a chance to walk through the new hotel tonight before I got here. It uh, sure is impressive, and it's, it's a pretty building. So I encourage everybody to take a walk through there. But, uh, well, you Mr. Webster, uh, he walked in the room, showed me it's pretty, pretty neat building. That's all I have. Yes, ma'am. Okay, um, I got to enjoy Saturday uh, morning with the kids choir and Santa Claus came to town. I don't know who all has Facebook, but um, I posted some pictures and Parks and Recs posted a whole bunch of pictures. And it was pretty fun. It was nice to hear the kids sing. Um, we got to go to a grassroots meeting today <coughs> um, at Hanson Chevrolet, which was a very eye-opening experience. It was very interesting. Um, and then today I also got to hang out at the Women's Community Club, which was really nice. Um, it's a, um, a lot of senior ladies that are there, but they're trying to recruit, recruit younger ladies. Um, so if there's something that you might want to join, I would suggest the Women's Community Club. They're really nice, good people. And for me, uh, Mosquito Abatement met uh, this Tuesday, and we reviewed the budget for next year and actually dropped uh, the budget by about $30,000 from what they had last year. So awesome. hopefully that's an improvement. Uh, 
<laughs> It'll depend on the water year, right. won't it? Um, but but they're, they're satisfied that they're moving along fairly good there. Uh, and as far as parks and recreations go, they did do a turkey trot. It was raining on thing when, when they were running it that Saturday, but uh, <laughs> just made it more challenging. Um, and I, I think that's about it. Then I don't have anything. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I would just like to report uh, this last Tuesday, we had the state come up uh, that is over the, the state with the citizen uh, uh, core council we actually had the state come up and visit with us uh, busy with us a little bit about what we're doing with our with cert and with our vips and also with our citizen core um, we went through things and talked to them a little bit about uh, we're reviewing those and trying to make those uh, more adequate for our city and uh, make sure that we can all work together and that way when we're in an emergency situation um, it's not complete and utter chaos uh, and we visit with those people and as we talked about what we're doing and things we're looking at, uh, they actually gave us kudos, said that they were impressed that we were willing to look at those things. Uh, the last time we looked and reviewed those boards was 2003. And uh, of course we know that things change and evolve through the years. And so as we visit with those people about the Citizen Corps and, and uh, our VIPs and CERT, they, uh, we explained to them what we were doing and what we were looking at, looking at bylaws and looking at how we can make those more effective. Uh, they both were very impressed and, and offered some resources and some other things to help us to uh, make those uh, more adequate and, and make them uh, operate properly. So I just that's all I have and I just wanted to bring that up. So other than that, um, we appreciate our council and the time that they put forth to attend those boards and those meetings. Uh, and just appreciate the council and all they do. Uh, it, I was in that meeting with Ruth also today and we learned a lot today, so DJ was there too. It was a good time. So we learned a lot today, and and uh, there's there's just a lot that goes on. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that people don't see. Um, these council members spend a lot of time reviewing and trying to understand issues and make good decisions that benefit our citizens and, and our town and make us more more uh, successful and, and help provide services for those that live in our community. And we appreciate them. Um, I'd also like to. Let our employees know how much we appreciate them as well. Um, we've uh, seen our employees out cleaning up leaves and, and trying to get our city cleaned up so that when weather comes, uh, our leaves are cleaned up and ready for the cold weather. So I'd like to, to thank our, our employees for all that they do. Um, we will now move into new business and we will have the presentation of 2013-2014 audit report. Jason uh, and the auditors, will, if they could come up, and we'll we'll do that. service funds and capital projects funds. 
the business type activities include our public utility fund that has our water, sewer, electric, waste collection, and green waste recycling, and the storm drain funds where we account for our storm drain activities in the city. Um, some ratios that we keep track of every year that, that I find very important to the city. The first ones are our cash. I think cash is very, our cash position, position is something we need to keep track of and, and make sure we're managing. Days cash represents the number of days normal operations can continue with no revenue collection. It does not include cash that is restricted for a specific purpose. Um, we have certain cash accounts that we keep on hand to either have to be spent on a capital project or have to be spent to retire debt. We don't include that, that, that cash in our day's cash calculations. Um, using non-restricted cash on hand, the city as a whole could finance operations without additional cash inflows for 132 days. This is a decrease of seven days from 2013. Days cash in governmental funds is increasing, primarily due to cash being received in RDAs from tax increment. And also, we did have a one-time event this year. We did have a, some proceeds from a land sale that came into the city this year that, that caused cash to go up and fund balance to go up in the RDAs. Days, um, days cash in, in business type funds is decreasing. This is primarily due to classifications we've had with restricted cash. The last couple of years we've been we've been looking at our classifications and had a couple changes to accounts. I believe if you were to do an apples to apples comparison of days cash for business type activities, um, there would be a very small change in days cash. To in fact, if you look at total cash in utility funds, it actually increased by $83,000 if you take unrestricted and restricted cash and, and look at both of those together. Um, liabilities to net position, it's, <clears throat> if, if you look here, it has went up in governmental funds. The reason it went up in governmental funds is because we issued a bond. Um, we issued a bond for the academy building, and that caused our liabilities to net position ratio to go up. And business type activities are going, that ratio is going down, and that's primarily because we're paying off our debt every year as scheduled for the, for the covenants of our debt. This shows a breakdown of our governmental activities revenue and how we receive our revenue. This includes, like I said before, the general fund, the fleet fund, the golf, library, and airport funds, RDA funds, debt service funds, and capital project funds. Um, charges for services shown up there for S26%. They're directly related to specific activities such as golf, swimming, recreation programs, special, special assessment payments, and things like that. Transfers in and internal activity account for 19% of total governmental activities revenue. This includes fund transfers and intercompany interest. Grants and contributions account for 6% of revenue, and sales tax accounts for an additional 19% of total governmental activities revenues. Um, the largest change in the distribution of revenue, if we look up here from the prior year, is in the grants and contribution line. Last year it was at 8%, this year it's at 6%, so we did receive less grants last year. Everything else was in one, within 1% of what it was the year before. This slide shows where our governmental funds are spent. And these percentages change if any department has large projects being funded in the year. It can change drastically from year to year, depending on how we budget our capital budgets. Uh, the net cost of services of all governmental activities is $8.5 million. This is taking all of the cost of the activities less the revenue brought in for the activities. The general government subsidy was 1.6 million. The public safety subsidy was 3.7 million. The public works subsidy was 2 million. And the culture, parks, and recreation subsidy was 2.1 million. 
and every year during the budget the, during the budgeting process the council decides what level of subsidy is acceptable for each area uh, the total the net cost of public safety increased by one percent from the prior year the 2015 budget anticipates some significant increases in the cost of fire and ambulance services due to the changing from a paid call department to a part-time department. So we'll, we'll probably see this change a little bit come next year. If we look at the net cost of public safety, we can see that police protection expenses, they're $2.8 million more than revenues. This was pretty much equal to what we saw last year. Um, all costs were covered as planned during the process of budgeting for the fiscal year 2013-14. And all future cost increases must be covered by either raising a combination of fees, transfers, and taxes, or by shifting funding from other programs, which may lower services or the quality of assets in those programs. Net police protection costs for the fiscal for the fiscal year were $151 per resident of the city. That's down $4 per resident from 2012, or from 2013, excuse me. And this represents a total decrease of $13 per resident as when you compare it to 2006. Moving on here, we're going into our business type funds, our utility funds. This is a net profit before transfer and thousands of dollars for our utility funds. Here's net profit after transfers. What you need to know with these profit numbers is business type funds. The profit numbers are shown for business type activities and they don't include cost spent on capital projects, but they do include depreciation on capital projects. So this doesn't necessarily, this doesn't represent cash in and out of the funds, but it, anything that was spent on a capital project isn't shown as an expense and depreciation is taken on the, those capital projects every year. The city's cash flow from utility activities would look significantly different than that profit. Here's a breakdown of the general fund revenue. The general fund is where we account for a lot of the city's activities and our utility activities. Um, it's where all the rec recreation, senior center, administration, public safety, everything like that comes out of the, the general fund. Transfers in were the largest source of revenue in the general fund in the current year. Even though the charges for services in the general fund were 15%, these charges are not sufficient to cover all direct and indirect expenses for the services provided. Sales tax is the second largest revenue source in the general fund. During the fiscal year 2014, sales tax revenues were 72,000 higher than the amount collected in the prior year. <coughs> and during fiscal year 2014, the city collected $371,000 less in sales tax than was collected in 2008. So we still aren't back up to the levels we were, were in 2008. Um, in the general fund, property tax is 6% of general fund revenues. If we look at our funding sources. This slide explains for the general fund where our money was spent. And like I said before, 42% in public safety, and there's the rest of the right down there. Well, it looks like I left that in from last year. This is actually the one for this year. <laughs> Sorry about that. So public safety is 46%, and that's our, that's our largest issue. Did parks and rec go down? It looks like from last year. As a percentage, it may have. Yeah, it did. Well, it went down yeah, percent. and that's because of a lot of the capital projects we had last year going through for parks and rec in the senior center. We had some very large projects last year go through the, that were budgeted for, like the senior center size and right. grade and some park work that we were doing, and we did a lot less of that in the current year. 
And I should have told the council, feel free to interrupt me if you need to to stay awake or any reason at all. I'm watching you on Ustream. Oh, very good. Um, we did have a couple of areas where budgets were over, overexpended. Um, the first one up there, I'm only going to talk about a couple of these, a couple of the bigger ones. Um, the budget overages were relatively small, with a couple of exceptions. The first one's the administration department up there. That's the department that I booked the city utilities in that I told you the charge would be coming through and we would be over budget on that one. We can't hear you. You look at them and in your, your voice is not going mine. Okay, I, I said that's... Sorry. There was a charge for city utilities that went through that department that has been brought up in council meeting previous to right now. Thank you, by the way. Um, and the other one's the Municipal Building Authority. That is the bond issuance cost on the bond that was issued last year for the Academy Building. Um, there's been a change lately in how bond issuance costs are accounted for. And because of it, I didn't, get, I didn't realize I needed to put in a budget on time, so I didn't get there. We also have, as planned, we have some RDA and EDA funds that are currently in deficit balances. Um, it'll take several years to eliminate these deficits, although they are going down fairly, fairly quickly in the last few years. Um, the deficits will decrease and cash will increase as the RDAs and EDAs collect tax increment. Here's a list of unassigned and assigned fund balance. This is the measure of the financial health of a fund. It does not represent cash available in a fund. It's not a savings account. For example, unassigned fund balance can include items such as a note receivable from another fund that is expected to be repaid in future years. So that wouldn't be cash, but it would show up as an asset. The portion of the unreserved fund balance used to cover the note receivable would not be available to be spent in the current period. Um, Unassigned and assigned fund balance in the general fund decreased by 54000 during the year. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that on subsequent slides. RDA and EDA fund balances increased by $1.4 million over the previous year. And this is due to tax increment payments being received in the funds and the large sale of land in Academy Square that happened last year. Both of those went towards fund balance. Um, RDA funds are used to encourage economic growth in the city. Here's some budget highlights from last year. This is, this is where we came in different than we had expected to come in. Any positive number there is a good number. Any negative number is a bad number, at least how that's how I look at it. Sales taxes were 36,000 higher than we budgeted. Um, franchise taxes for vet tax were 35,000 higher. This was primarily due to more gas being used in the city because it was a cold year than we expected to be used. So, Ambulance and fire fees, we overestimated how much we would, reserve, we would receive from these services by $116,000. Um, we already talked about the administration department spent more on city utilities than was budgeted. Recreation came in under budget by $71,000. And then you can see some of the community development, police and streets all came in under budget. Um, the net effect of this was fund balance increased by $3,000 for the year, which I was really, really excited to see after we had a $355,000 unplanned item that was needed to be covered through the budget. Um, I think that's all I have on that. Just wanted to review the council's goal their goal has been to maintain the unassigned and assigned fund balance of the general fund slightly lower than the state limit. This state limit has caused me fits ever since I've been at Green City. And once again this year, there's been a change by the auditor on the definition of the state limit. What the state says is you're allowed to have an unassigned and assigned fund balance a certain percentage of your total revenue for the year in some way, shape, or form. Previously, they said you can have 
Last year it was 25% of the next year's budgeted revenues. The year before that, it was 18% of the next year's budgeted revenues. So they changed it to 25. This year they changed it to 25% of the current year revenues, which is not something I can predict beforehand what exactly revenues will be, so it makes it a little bit difficult. And also that doesn't include any sort of transfer. <coughs> Because of this, we right now are very, very close to the 25% limit that we're allowed to have in the general fund, fund balance. Um, I think we're going to need to revisit our goal for fund balance and cash on hand during the budget process this year, just to talk about how this affects us and make sure we understand the goal. Um, in conclusion, the city's financial condition is good. However, the city should continue to conserve cash and increase the city's cash reserves to prepare for any possible future economic downturns. All new projects should be evaluated to determine the effect on the city's cash position. I'd like to put a graphic on this uh, slide. I haven't changed it in six years I've been here. <laughs> Um, drafting the financial statements is a big job, and the city has been awarded the Government Finance Officers Association's Financial Reporting Certificate for the 28th consecutive year. I'd like to commend the administration staff, and especially this year, Mary Kate Christensen, who put the book together and went to a lot of work to get our financial report together this year. Um, because of their dedication and hard work, this financial report was made possible. I'd also like to thank our auditors, Davis and Lott, for all of their work on the financial report and helping us get ready for that. Um, I'd like to thank the City Council for their support over the year, past year, and I look forward to working with them in the future in order to continue managing the City's finances in a responsible man manner. Um, does the council have any questions before I turn the time over to the auditors? If not, we have David Rogers here from Davis and Bot, and he's going to give you an update on their audit and a report on that. Thank you. Jason. Thanks, Jason. Where would you like me? Would you like me on the podium or the table? Either way, you just have to color right up to the microphone. The mic's better at the table. Yeah, I would recommend the table. Okay. Well, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, it's been really good working on the audit this year with Jason and his team. They're very capable and they know what they're doing and they, uh, it appears they have the best interests of the city in mind as they do their jobs and they perform their jobs really well. Uh, you each should have received two documents. Uh, one is the management report and then one is the single audit report. And then included in with the management report is a communication with those charged with governance. And we'll begin with that. Really yes, please. Sorry. Is it 2012 date correct or 2014? It should be 2014. Okay. Good catch. Mine says 14. No, on the, on the, on the right. single audit report. Single audit. Oh, single. Okay. Yeah, if you want, we can get you new labels and we can That's replace okay. those. That's okay, I just want to make sure the information is correct. Yeah. Uh, so this letter communication with those charged with governance, uh, this basically tells what uh, our responsibilities as auditors are and how the audit went. Uh, professional standards require that we communicate these things to you. Uh, in that middle paragraph, under qualitative aspects of accounting practices, Management's responsible for the selection and use of appropriate accounting policies. Uh, the next paragraph talks about accounting estimates and that the estimates are uh, based on management's knowledge and experience, how things have gone in the past. The two major estimates that Brigham City has is depreciation. Uh, that's a pretty straightforward estimate. It's the capital assets are depreciated over their useful lives. And then on the next page, uh, compensated absences. 
Uh, that's any accrued vacation leave and sick pay benefits that may be there. Um, difficulties encountered in performing the audit, there were none. Um, like I mentioned before, uh, the city staff is very easy to work with. When we needed documentation, they had it readily available. Uh, corrected and uncorrected misstatements. All the misstatements that we asked to be cor corrected were corrected. Uh, there were no disagreements with management. Uh, we received a management representation letter from Jason. Uh, it's, uh, I think it was six or seven pages long that he had to sign and say these are the representations that we as the city made to Davis and Bob, the auditors. Uh, there were no management cons consultations with other independent accountants. Uh, none of the issues that came up this year were beyond our capabilities. Um, and then other finding issues, there weren't anything. The audit went pretty smoothly. And you know that's the required communication we have for you there. If you look at the management report, uh, if you turn to the table of contents, you can see what's included here. We are, it talks about our responsibilities for looking at internal controls. Um, and then also, uh, we have some state compliance requirements that we're supposed to look at from the state auditor's office. And then there's a schedule of findings, recommendations, and responses. So the first letter, uh, it talks about internal control. As an auditor, we look at internal control to focus the audit testing that we're going to do. You know, if there's good controls in an area, we probably won't look at the detail as much as if we would if there weren't any or weren't good controls in an area. Uh, we don't express an opinion on the effectiveness of the internal control, but we do use it to focus our audit procedures. And if we do notice anything that's a significant deficiency or a material weakness, uh, we will report that to you. And it describes what those things are here in the letter. This year, uh, we did have one thing we considered to be a material weakness in internal control. On the top of page two, it says material weakness is a deficiency or a combination of deficiencies in internal control such that there is a reasonable possibility that a material misstatement of the entity's financial statements will not be prevented or detected and corrected on a timely basis. And we consider deficiency 2014-1, which we'll get to in a minute, described in the accompanying schedule of findings and question costs to be a material weakness. Um, so I think the key thing there is that there, if there's not a control in place that can either detect or prevent prevent and correct or detect and correct, um, then there's a problem. You know, sometimes small things get through, that's not a big deal, but when it's potential for a material weakness, um, and we base materiality based on total assets, total liabilities, revenue, depending on, there's different factors that we consider. But if you'll turn over to page six, um, we'll talk about the material weakness. Uh, it, was, it had to do with con capitalization of fixed assets. Uh, there was some land, $375,000 roughly, uh, that was purchased for the watershed project that was double booked on the financial statements. Now, the, the capitalization of fixed assets is a manual process that happens at the end of the year. And uh, Jason can correct me if I'm wrong, but it was lumped in a group and capitalized, but then there was also a note that was misunderstood that capitalized the land separately as well. The, the end game of this, I guess, when that happens, your assets are overstated by $375 and your expenses are understated by $375,000. Uh, in this audit, our materiality was $260,000. Uh, so it's kind of hard to argue out that that was a material misstatement. Uh, when it was brought up to Jason uh, and his staff, they immediately came up with a reconciliation procedure that they will apply in the future that should mitigate that and catch any errors that could happen during the process. So it is a material misstatement, but I feel comfortable that they've got uh, a procedure in place that will catch this in the future. And 
beyond that, there were no, there haven't been any material weaknesses in the past few years, um, and I don't anticipate any in the future, and there weren't any significant deficiencies other than this as well. Now, if you'll turn back, there's no page numbers on, uh, it'll be page three. It's the Independent Auditor's Report on Compliance, Non-Internal Controls Over Compliance in Accordance with the State Compliance Audit Guide. And as Jason mentioned, this thing changes every year. With the new state auditor last year, there were some significant changes at what they wanted us to look for. Uh, this year, there were also some changes. And so it's kind of a work in progress as the state auditor decides what he wants us to look at. Uh, the general compliance requirements that we looked at for Brigham City, some of these we, didn't, we don't look at every year. We're only required to look at them every other year or every third year. Uh, you can see the list there from cash management to the nepotism policy to the Open Public Meetings Act. We look at uh, compliance requirements with all of these. Now, it's important to note that we as auditors don't certify that the state is compliant. It's not a legally binding thing. Uh, it's just as we look through it, um, we just say in material respects, everything looks good. And on page four, we do issue an opinion. In our opinion, Brigham City Corporation complied in all material respects with the compliance requirements referred to above that could have a direct and material effect on the city or on each of its major state programs for the year ended June 30th, 2014. Um, then I think the rest of it is, oh, some of the state compliance issues that there were, if you turn over to page seven, and Jason already mentioned some of these in his presentation. Uh, in the current year, there's a budgetary compliance issue. The municipal building authority was over budget, as was the capital projects fund fiber optics. Uh, Jason already explained why those were over. Um, Prior year findings, last year there was a finding on the state retirement system. Every year the council is required to formally adopt the pickup of the employee's portion of the required contribution to the state retirement contributory plan. Um, I believe this was done in January last year, as of January of 2014. So for this year, this finding has been resolved. Uh, just be sure you keep doing that. That's an annual thing that should happen. Uh, next page, 2013-2, uh, transfers from utility enterprise funds. I believe you're aware of this. This is why the administration budget was over budget, was because um, the state auditor is pushing that the utilities used by the city buildings throughout the city uh, be charged at the same rate as it is to uh, the city's um, citizens and customers. Uh, so that was a finding last year. This item has been resolved and is in the process of uh, being resolved in the future. Um, the calculation was really good. I was impressed at uh, what Jason came up with with figuring out what water and electric everybody used, so that was really good. Uh, the 2012-2 is the fund balances, and this will be an ongoing finding. As Jason mentioned, the RDA West Forest Street and the EDA Northwest Project are, have negative fund balances. Uh, but over the next 10 or 11 years, those should be uh, caught up, and that was a planned thing that happened there. Uh, that's all I want to talk about in that one. Uh, we don't have the financial statements in front of us, but included in the financial statements are our audit report. And that audit report, oh, there they are right there. Um, as auditors, we're not here to look at every single transaction. We're not here to uh, seek out any type of fraud that may be there. We're responsible as auditors to find any material problems. And our opinion states that in all material respects, the financial statements presented, uh, well, the financial statements are presented correctly in all material uh, respects. So our audit opinion is there on page three, and you can read through that. Um, and that's really the primary thing that you are required to retain an auditor for, is for that opinion, to make sure that your financial statements are uh, correct in all material respects. Um, 
let's move on to the single audit report. That's the other bound report that I gave you. And I apologize that it says 2012 on there. It should be 2014. Uh, a single audit is required if there are expenditures of federal awards over $500,000 during the year. Uh, there were, if you turn to page, I believe it is six, or page five. This is the schedule of expenditures of federal awards. Uh, it lists it by department and by grant or loan uh, that came from federal expenses. Uh, the total expenditures of federal awards during the year were $895,000. Um, there was one larger grant that we actually looked at in the single audit. That was the Brigham City Hydro Generation Project, and it was over $500,000. Uh, as we uh, went through that, we vouched expenses. We did a visit of the hydro plant. Um, and we, let's see, the opinion for the single audit is on the second page of the letter. I, I believe that's going to be page two. In our opinion, Brigham City Corporation complied in all material respects with the compliance requirements referred to above that could have a direct and material effect on each of its major federal programs for the year ended June 30th, 2014. The single audit was really clean this year. Um, things went smoothly and there were no issues as far as the federal funding occurs. Uh, we are required in uh, this letter on the next page, the top paragraph, to mention the financial statement material weakness that we found regarding the capitalization of the fixed assets. We've already discussed that, so we won't go into more detail on it here. Um, this report will be submitted to uh, the it's the whitehouse.gov website, those people that take care of the single audits. Uh, this will be submitted in the next few weeks. And, you know, I guess overall it went really well. Any questions on anything we've covered? What project do we do here? What project do we do here? Thank you. All right. I remember. Uh, Well, we only looked at the one grant, the hydro grant. Uh, is he, was there a snowplow? Oh, we did buy yeah, a snowplow. Yeah. For the snow airport? That's snowplow equipment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, if there are no questions, then once again, it's been a pleasure. We enjoy the relationship we have with the city. And it's very good to work with Jason and his team. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Thank you. And I will have work. Any other questions, Council? Plenty of reading. Okay. Well, if there's no uh, further questions, uh, we will close our council. We need a motion to close our council meetings. So moved. Oh. Oh. We close this. We close this. We go under. Then we close the close session. We don't close to go into closed session. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that correction, Council Member. But I, I wanted to add something. Um, I know that a while back ago we had scheduled for a retreat for the Council to get together and talk about stuff. And I was wondering, are we, did we schedule it for next year? Because I want to put it on my We're program. looking into January. And Sharon's, Sharon's supposed to be looking into that and getting back with the Council. So for sure, January? Yeah. Okay. Well, what about the second Thursday? I'll have to look. I, why don't we do it? The, let's do it on the third Thursday. Sorry.
session. Thank you. Thank you for coming and attending tonight.